let's get started. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, introduction to SAC plus FPGA solution. My name is uh, Marek Vashut. And first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I work as a contractor um, for a couple of companies, but mostly for Deng Software Engineering. Uh, for the most part of my day job, I do uh, Linux kernel engineering, uh, U-boot bootloader work, open embedded work. And uh, I'm a maintainer in some way or the other in these projects. I also do FPGA work, but uh, while I do it at my work, I don't do it uh, as a professional FPGA designer. So that's pretty much about it, uh, about me. Now, uh, about this talk, I'll structure it in this uh, six uh, parts. First of all, I would like to introduce you to what the SOC is, what the FPGAs are, uh, what the combination is, how it looks like, uh, what an FPGA is, and so on. So you get like the, the basic knowledge in, and then I would like to go through all the available SOG FPGA solutions, show you the small ones, the big ones, and finally, how to get the big ones running with Linux the right way. So let's get right to the first part. Uh, what is an SOC? So I guess since we are at the Embedded Linux Conference, most of you knows what an SOC is, a system on chip. Uh, that would be uh, some sort of CPU core, today mostly an ARM core, but they can, there can be like a MIPS, uh, RISC-V, whatever. Uh, with some peripherals that's put on a single piece of silicon from which you have some pads you can put it on your uh, on your board and run some code on the on the CPU core communicate with the outside world kind of standard thing right uh, an FPGA uh, this is a little bit more complicated that's a programmable logic solution so it's again to simplify it it's a chip which again has a lot of IOs but uh, Wow. Uh, but uh, you can put some sort of user-defined logic function into the programmable logic so the chip will do something which you want. You can define that on your own. Uh, think of, for example, a UART. Uh, you know, you can program UART into an FPGA. It will behave like an UART, that sort of thing. You can obviously put more complex stuff in there. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail shortly. Now, if you combine an SOC and an FPGA together, then you get benefit of both. So basically, you have a single piece of silicon on which you have a CPU core, like a hardware CPU core, and a programmable piece of logic into which you can put whatever you need. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit more about the FPGAs. So I said it's programmable logic. You can put whatever you want into it. But what should you really envision under the term programmable logic? Well. Um, Think of a device which is reasonably high speed. We are talking like hundreds of megahertz uh, on the logic side. It has plenty of IOs, like uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of IO. This is what we are talking about. It's extremely parallel because, well, you have like these um, hundreds of thousands of blocks which you can program in the FPGA and chain them together somehow. So like everything happens in parallel in the FPGA. And it's extremely useful for stuff like, you know, parallelized workloads, think video processing. Um, you get some video data from, let's see, some um, video encoder. You just push it into the FPGA. You can have some sort of filter in the FPGA. So you pipe them through the FPGA. The filter is applied. You capture them on the other side. Or, yeah, crypto, for example. You know, you push a lot of data into the FPGA. The crypto happens in parallel. You capture them on the other side, that sort of thing. Uh, but you can do pretty much anything with the FPGAs. ASIC prototyping is another thing. You can synthesize custom um, hardware blocks into the FPGA, you know, like that sort of stuff. If you need, like, bazillion UARTs, well, yeah, knock yourself out. Just put them in the FPGA, and you get bazillion UARTs. Uh, there are multiple vendors of the FPGA, so there's a lot of stuff to choose from. Xilinx, Altera are the big ones. And then there are a lot of specialized smaller players like Latest, MicroSemi, uh, Cypress, and so on. Um, now, if you look into the FPGA in a little bit more detail, um, the FPGA vendors will tell you like it's super difficult technology and so on. It actually is not. 
So this on the left is a schematic of an FPGA. It's kind of simplified, but that's pretty much all there is in the FPGA. It's not that difficult. So as you can see, like these are the I.O. pads. This is what is actually physically coming out of the chip. Uh, and there are some I.O. adaptation units. So like uh, you can get like differential pairs out of the FPGA that happens on the I.O block sides. Uh, you can get multiple different voltages on the I.O. pads of the FPGA. It's also done by the I.O. blocks. Uh, but ultimately that is connected into this blue all-encompassing goo, which is called the, the global interconnect, and it connects everything in the FPGA together. And it can be reprogrammed, so you can wire it pretty much in any way you want. It's like this massive big patch board. Now, uh, the other thing which is connected into the global interconnect is this red blobs, which are the places where you synthesize your logic, actually. These are called the logic array blocks in Altera parlance, in Xilinx, I believe it is CLBs. <coughs> and this is actually where you define the logic functions. Now, if you have these blocks where you can define your logic function and like combine them together by programming the global interconnect, you can effectively assemble together any sort of logical function. So that's how the FPGA works internally. Uh, act if we look a little bit more in detail on this logic array block, it's actually a little bit more complicated, but not that much. Um, it's assembled from uh, multiple logic elements, which are the smallest building blocks. You can see it here. And these logic elements are actually connected together by local interconnect, but that's like just a small optimization so that uh, you avoid signal propagation delays. Uh, if you go all the way down, you reach the logic element, which looks internally like that. So it's just a lookup table with multiple inputs and optionally a register, which allows you to assemble both uh, combinatorial and sequential logic. And ultimately, if you chain these together in some way which you need it, you can assemble any sort of uh, digital logic block from that be it simple thing as UART, be it uh, USB 3 controller or whatever. So that's how the FPGAs work. Now, why would you want to have a SOC plus FPGA on your, on your like board, right? So uh, you can look at it in two ways. Um, one way is you need something special. Like uh, you need a CPU which has like crazy amount of whatever UARTs, right? So no one will make you such a CPU, and if you had decided, okay, I want an ASIC, it will be crazy expensive. And if it's a small run, it's more cost efficient to just put in a SOC FPGA, put the CPU there with the, so with the FPGA, and just synthesize the UARTs into the FPGA, right? Uh, the other thing is, uh, why don't you put the CPU into the FPGA? That's looking at it the other way around. Well, the reason for that is that if you put a CPU into the FPGA, it will cost a tremendous amount of resources in the FPGA. And I mentioned that the FPGA fabric is running in hundreds of megahertz range, but if you put something complex in there, the, the speed of the fabric kind of decreases because you need to handle signal propagation delays through all the elements in the FPGA. So ultimately, the CPU will waste a lot of your FPGA resources and be slow. So that's not great either. But if you just need some specialized hardware, the SOC FPGA is kind of a nice compromise. Now, uh, are there any questions to this intro sort of part for SOC FPGA? Uh, is there anything? No? Good. Uh, so OK, let's get to the second part, uh, what's available. Actually, the entire landscape is covered. So from the like super small devices all the way to the biggest ones with like our um, uh, Cortex A53, it's the big ones, the ARM64. Uh, so first of all, I would like to go through the uh, Cypress devices, which are like super small. They cannot actually run Linux, but they are pretty interesting in my opinion. Uh, originally, this came from 8051 with some analog blocks. The background story is that these devices were used in like smoke detectors. And every smoke detector is kind of specific in its own way. And like designing the analog circuitry over and over again was kind of meh, boring, right? 
So what they came up with is let's put a small CPU core into there and then programmable analog mesh, which can be configured in some way or the other, and like the blocks could be chained together and tweaked uh, so that the vendors of these smoke detectors could just buy one chip and then just load the programmable part of it. Now, this was the beginning, but right now they have like a newer, bigger parts with ARM Cortex-M and they grew optional digital blocks, Bluetooth LE, and so on. It can run RTOS, and it's pretty interesting, in my opinion. And you can get a kit for like 10 bucks somewhere. So the downside is the tool is Windows only to program these. But uh, in fact, the tool only generates like a register block, which you need to program into the, the well, the, the PSOG. And then the programmable logic is loaded, and then you can do whatever you want. So. Technically, if you export this block into your RTOS, there is no problem, basically. Plus, there is a project called the PSOC Tools, which is working on mapping this programmable block so there will be an open source tool. Well, there is kind of open source tool available work in progress. Uh, if you are interested in these small things, definitely check the PSOC Tools. It might actually already be able to do whatever you want. Uh, back to the proprietary tool, it's basically like a schematic entry for the programmable part to make it easy for people. So this is how it looks. Uh, this is a thermometer actually, so here are some really schematic entry blocks. Once you're done with that, you just click compile, it spits out some main C and bazillion other C files. So you can call like convenience functions, yeah, it's that sort of thing. Um, but again, you can also like pull out the register programming from this tool, put it into your own RTOS. There are BSPs available for free RTOS, uh, UCOS Keel, I believe, as well. So just put it in there, then get into the RTOS main function, and then do whatever you want. Now, uh, let's move on to another one, which is Micro Semi Smart Fusion 2. Uh, this one. It's actually a little better in that it's still Cortex-M, but it has uh, DDR memory, so it can run Linux. Uh, the footnote is the Linux kernel port is like ancient vendor kernel, well, I don't know, something ancient, and still you see Linux, so not super amazing, and yeah, too bad, but it's also mostly targeted at running uh, RTOS solutions. Uh, you can get a kit for like 125 bucks. Uh, I actually tried uh, getting this going. I installed their development tool, which is called Libero, and here is how to how to get it installed. Uh, it's kind of complicated, so you might want to read it once I'm done with the presentation, anyways. Um, but this is not all of it, actually. Once you get through all this annoying stuff to get the Libero installed, you then need to search the internet to find all these magic incantations and magic variables which you need to specify in uh, your, uh, uh, which you need to export in your shell to even allow the Libero to launch. And if you don't have all of them actually running and uh, exported, then Libero will kind of start, but it will fail at random places. So yeah, there is a lot of hassle with that. And ultimately, I wanted to show you how the U-Boot and UC Linux works, but uh, even flashing the demo image didn't get me a serial console, so I don't know, maybe I'm getting something wrong. Yeah, and obviously no upstream support for this at all. It would be real nice if someone actually bought that kit and got it upstream. That would be super nice. And Actually, I would be super happy to help you out getting it upstream into U-Boot, uh, maybe also Linux, if I can help there. So if you have any interest, that would be amazing. So that's pretty much it for the Cortex-M ones, for the small ones. Now let's go to the Linux ones. Uh, is there any, are there any questions for the Cortex-M ones? Is there anything? No. OK. So getting to the uh, Cortex-A ones, uh, the Alterasog FPGA is like the first one I have in the list just because it's starting from A. Uh, it's Cortex-A9, so it's a little bit older core, but it's ARM Cortex-A. Uh, uh, they have it in both uh, UMP and SMP configuration with the standard peripherals on the SOC side, like CAN, SPI, uh, DDR, DRAM, 
the sort of usual stuff. Uh, Altera has an upcoming strat extend, which will be ARM64. Um, this stuff runs the usual stack, so you boot Linux. Uh, there are RQS offerings for this, but that's not the main target. Now, um, there is another kind of interesting quirk for the Altera. It is capable of running in this AMP configuration, which means you can run like Linux on one core and RTOS on the other. So in case you need like some special real-time, hard real-time control, you can run it on one core and Linux will be doing, I don't know, like some sort of UI thing on the other core. So if you delve into the Altera, you will definitely run into the Quartus design tool. Now it, I believe it's called Intel FPGA tools at this point. Uh, it's proprietary. But unlike the previous design tools, it runs fine on Linux for certain definitions of fine. Uh, it doesn't crash out of the box. And if you install it, it actually starts and does its thing. So it's not that terrible. Uh, if you're interested in something open source in terms of Altera, there's Project Typhoon. So you might want to look it up or talk to me about that. Um, but once you get through the quarters, you will obviously want to boot your device, uh, and I would like to talk about that on, on Altera a little. Uh, so you have the obvious options, U-boot, vendor U-boot or mainline U-boot. On Altera, just go for mainline U-boot unless you have ARIA 10, where this is kind of work in progress, and Stratix 10, this is also submitted. So th all the Generation 5 stuff that's supported in mainline U-boot, um, the FPGA loading works, everything works. So. If there is a bug in mainline U-boot, it's actually a bug. It's not a missing feature. Uh, Altera has some U-boot, but it's like ancient, and it's just not worth even looking at it. Well, there is another thing. If you're super hostile to GPL, there is a bootloader called MPL. It's BSD license that basically loads a binary into RAM and executes it. And it like super sucks, because all the bugs which are fixed in this Altera vendor reboot and uh, all the other bugs which are actually fixed in mainline are still there. So sometimes it fails to calibrate RAM and this sort of thing. I <laughs> wow. <coughs> <laughs> Whoa, what, what happened? Is it okay? Well, yeah, it seems to work. I was just like getting ready to deliver the finishing blow for this bootloader and just completely lost my traction here. Uh, yeah, so this one sucks. Uh, just <laughs> don't use it. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, OK, so now let's get back to the uh, Altera Linux kernel support. Situation is kind of the same. But Altera is doing the good thing that they're kind of tracking mainline. Um, so their vendor kernel releases are kind of close to mainline. And there's like a couple of patches on top of it. Uh, then again, you can use mainline, and there is not that much functionality missing in mainline. Uh, what is missing for the most part? On the SOC side, it's all there, and I don't think anything is missing. On the FPGA side, uh, config has uh, DTO overlays, definitely missing. Uh, the FPGA manager is already uh, in mainline. I didn't update my slides properly, uh, so this is in mainline. Uh, yeah, and I believe it's just the DTO support for like loading the FPGA and then binding uh, the drivers to what's in the FPGA now. Uh, actually, there will be a device tree overlay buff now today at uh, 6, is it? At 6. So if you're interested in like loading FPGAs with DTOs and DTOs in general, come to the buff. It's definitely going to be interesting. Uh, so. I'll get to that in a bit. Actually, once I'm done with the thing, I'll get to loading Ubud into that. So, uh, yeah, okay, let me get through the thing. Uh, now, uh, Xilinx has two offerings uh, Cortex A9, and the, that's the Zing 7000, and the new one, uh, Zing MP, that's ARMv8 uh, A53. It's again the same thing. On the SOC side, you get uh, SDMMC, uh, SPI, NOR, uh, DDR, CAN, the usual stuff. Uh, actually, Xilinx decided that with ZingMP they will put in more interesting stuff like multimedia stuff. That's why they put in like a VPU and a GPU. Except the problem is they put in a our Mali 400 GPU, which is like ancient and it kind of sucks because there is no open source driver, unlike, for example, IMX6, which has the Adnavi, which is amazing. Uh, so 
Damali that's basically just blobs and it's like ancient blobs. Uh, GBM support is missing. If you want to run like uh, modern Linux 3D graphics stack, just forget it. You're basically stuck with either X11 or battling the blobs. So uh, the upside is that recently there has been a new activity in the Lima driver and it is now possible to actually use it on ZingMP and to such an extent that it can do off-screen rendering. So if you are interested in that part, you should definitely check the Lima driver. There is a guy from China actually writing a new shader compiler for the Mali 400 and it's super exciting. So this, this is really making me happy to see that. And with a little patch, it can work on, on the Zing. So that's great. Um, now, except for the GPU, the stack is usually the same. So you boot Linux, nothing really that interesting. Uh, RTOS ports, again, exist. Uh, the Zing MP has the perk that it has uh, Cortex R5, I believe. So if you need like an RTOS capable core, use that one. Um, but otherwise, let's let's move on to the software support. Uh, in case of Xilinx Vivado, again, it's kind of on par with the Altera stuff. So for the Xilinx Vivado, it's again proprietary, it's big, but it kind of works, right? Now there is also an open source solution for the Zinc 7000 in the works. So like they are analyzing the bitstream format and work in progress. It's actually done by the same guy who did the. Uh, the Ice Storm project. Uh, so, if you're interested in that, look around the Ice Storm project. Look for the, his uh, new Zinc stuff. Now, uh, with Zinc, you have two options again uh, with the bootloader. Again, uh, one of them is U-boot. If you have like a Zinc 7000, use mainline U-boot. It's just no-brainer. Its support is there and just works. Uh, on the Zing MP, things are a little more complicated because this is a new chip and the upstream support is still work in progress. So it's like going into mainline, but your mileage may, may worry a little. If you think mainline has all you need for the Zing MP, then just use mainline. Um, if not, there is this combination of FSBL plus U-boot, which is what Xilinx recommends. So they have their own patch to U-boot plus the FSBL, which is like a preloader, which in it's the chip, loads the FPGA, loads power management unit, and then starts U-boot, basically. So if you're missing something from mainline, which is kind of critical, and you cannot really use mainline U-boot, that's what you will have to use. But this is only ZingMP sort of thing. Um, as for the Linux support, yeah, it's again comparable to Altera pretty much. On the Zing 7000, uh, most of the IP blocks are support supported in mainline already in like recent 4.x, uh, 4.1x. Uh, for the Zing MP, that's kind of coming in now as we speak. It's just being fed into the mainline. Uh, what is again missing is the uh, configFS support for loading the DTOs. Actually, the FPGA manager is also in mainline, both for the Zing and Zing MP. Uh, the vendor kernel, well, there's like a stack of 600 patches on the Xilinx, so uh, you can probably cut it down to like 200 if you throw away everything which you don't need. That's kind of the state of the Xilinx vendor kernel on top of 4.9. So, yeah, to answer your question, there we go, right? Uh, so how to get these ports booting kind of comparative analysis. Uh, to get the U-boot working on both of these uh, SOG FPGAs, uh, on Altera, you start Quartus, just compile your project. Uh, it allows you to then run this uh, BSP editor tool, uh, which will generate you some header files. Use a QTS filter script, which is from mainline U-boot. There we go. So this QTS filter will take these files generated by the Quartus BSP editor, make them a little civilized so you can put them into the upstream U-boot source tree. You put it into your, like your board slash uh, vendor slash board slash QTS. Then you just add uh, SOG FPGAC and make file, which you can copy from another board because there is nothing there. Everything else is controlled by device tree. You put in your device tree in your board config and then type like make foo Def config make it will generate this sort of uh, SFP file. You take the SFP file and then like write it either in your SPI flash or put it into uh, 
some specific offset on an SD card, which I don't remember. It's in the documentation for the U-boot, so just check the readme. And then you like flick the board on and it starts. Everything works, obviously, because it's mainline. Uh, then you use the FPGA command to load FPGA if that's your thing. Uh, but I would like advise against loading FPGA in U-boot if you don't have to. Just use the uh, FPGA manager in Linux. That's a better approach to that. Uh, on the Zing, it's quite similar. Fire up the design tool, Vivado, compile your design, click export hardware, you get the HDF file out of it. Uh, yeah, the HDF file is actually secretly a zip file, so you just like type unzip foo HDF. It just expands into a couple of files. Depending on which thing you have, you get either PSU or PS7 init files. Uh, just again, copy them into your board slash whatever. Uh, copy and make file and a couple of other missing files, add config, type make, def config, make. You get a boot bin file. This one, again, install either and do a fat, par a fat partition on SD card. Uh, that's a bit of a limitation, I believe, of the boot room, but uh, this is something you would have to check with Xilinx. Or just put it on the beginning of SPI flash, flick the board on, it boots. Again, use standard FPGA command to load the FPGA. So, does that answer your question? Right. Uh huh. Yeah, right. So, you mean like a uh, thousand uh, SD cards, right? Right. So yeah, there will be definitely a... So the question is, um, we have to manufacture like a thousand boards. So where do you put the initial U-boot on those boards? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, well, if you have a script which programs your SPI flash in the manufacturing, then you just take this uh, SFP file, just put it in this SPI flash, that's it. Uh, yeah, actually, with the Altera tools, you said you use ARIA, right? So with the Altera tools, there is uh, there's something which allows you to program the QSPI flash directly. So you say, like, this foo bar tool program QSPI. You need the JTAG port, yeah. Y you actually need the blaster too for that. But if you're like manufacturing it, then you probably want some sort of like a toaster sort of device where you attach to the SPI flash. It's the same, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, right. So I can move on from this one to the vendor kernel FPGA loading horror. So. Uh, Thing is, you want to reload the FPGA in the kernel, right? So the vendors came up with these interfaces. Like, how do we do that? Well, let's create a dev interface into which you like you cat the bitstream in there, and it programs the FPGA, and then let the user control the bridges between the FPGA and the and the SOC. Uh, the problem is, uh, you kind of bind drivers to the stuff that's in the FPGA, and then you accidentally reload the FPGA. What happens there? Well, it's game over. It's like done. So. This doesn't work unless you have like a super specially strictly controlled users, which you don't. So there is a better way to do it, and that's to use the device tree overlays. And again, now Frank will probably bash me about that. Uh, so device tree overlays is a way to patch the device tree which you load into your kernel to describe the hardware. So you can patch it at runtime with that. Um, and the idea is that you just describe the additional part of the hardware which you are adding into the kernel. Just compile it like the usual device tree, load it into the kernel, and something happens. The kernel just recognizes the new hardware, binds drivers, and so on. How does that look? This, this entire process is actually super simple. There is an example there. 
Uh, so basically, this is using the out of three config FS loader, which is not going to happen in mainline for a while. Uh, but, well, it's kind of one of the only reasonable options now ish. Right? Uh, yeah, so the demo is that basically you create this sort of uh, MyDTO directory in the config FS device tree overlays. Uh, compile your overlay, it's just cat it into this DTBO file. The kernel has hooks for that, it just loads the DTBO, patches its own uh, device tree, and the new devices basically pop up. That's the gist of it, anyway. Uh, if you want to unload the DTO, you can do that. Just uh, remove the directory, the overlay. The right I don't know if that can be uh, actually seen, but you just do rmd on that directory, and that's it. It's that simple. Cool. Uh, device tree overlay source looks pretty much a lot like a device tree. You just have this like plugin annotation at the beginning, and then you just describe the fragments, which say, okay, I patch this Ethernet here. Uh, what I want to add into this Ethernet node is that my FI mode is RGMII, and I want to enable the Ethernet. Uh, this other case is that I want to add an 1891E from under an I2C switch. That's how it kind of DTO looks like. Now let's mix it up with the FPGA Manager. Uh, so FPGA Manager is a new framework in the Linux kernel which allows you to load the bit streams into the FPGAs. It allows you to toggle the bridges correctly. And if you combine it with the, with the DTOs, uh, you are able to actually say, okay, so I have this bit stream and it creates devices under these bridges and they need to be enabled and they are like mapped like this and that. Uh, so that's that's what I'm going to show you now. Uh, we actually have device tree, uh, we actually have uh, FPGA manager support for all the mainstream FPGA devices, which is Altera, everything, Xilinx, everything. Uh, latest IC40 actually is there as well with SPI interface. And yes, it supports partial reconfiguration. I haven't seen that used yet. So how does it work? Okay, again, you describe what's in the FPGA and the DTO, right? You compile the DTO, you load it into the kernel. So first thing that happens is that the FPGA manager is actually triggered and loads the FPGA with the matching bitstream. Now the matching bitstream is fetched through uh, the kernel uh, firmware interface, so it has to be somewhere in lib firmware, something something RBF or something something bit for Xilinx. Uh, the next thing is uh, it enables the bridges between the SOC and the FPGA. And finally, only after that is all ready, it can start binding the drivers. Now, there's a quirk when you remove the DTO in that um, the bridges are shut, uh, well, the drivers are unbound first, then the bridges are shut off, and ultimately the FPGA is not turned off. Now the reason for that is that there can be something in the FPGA which you didn't describe in the device tree overlay, which can be super critical to the system and that can just downclog the FPGA or unprogram it because otherwise it could, I don't know, kill the system or kill somebody. So that's why the FPGA remains programmed and running even after you unload the DTO. So how does an FPGA manager DTO looks like? Um, very similar to a regular DTO. In this case, I'm patching uh, the bridge. I create one FPGA area, so that's the, the partial reconfiguration thing. In this case, I have only one area, so the entire FPGA is populated by a single bit stream. There we go. In this case, output file R RBF. And uh, in this example, I'm adding one single UART, which is under this bridge, which is, there we go, yeah, this bridge. Uh, once I load this device tree overlay, this new UART will just pop up as def TTY as something. That's the example. Now, uh, I should have some sort of conclusion, but I just couldn't come up with what to put on this slide. I have no idea. Well, uh, the mainline support for all the SOG FPGAs is amazing. Obviously, you should use it. Um, DTO support, well, it's coming. So, thank you for your attention, and do you have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, the question was, how does it work uh, with the loading sequence so that the U-boot starts running and uh, what happens then, right? Uh, well, I'll just use the Altera as an example. Uh, basically, yes, U-boot comes up. Uh, actually, before U-boot, the CPU comes up, right? It has to start reading from, like, address zero. And this is, in modern CPUs, it's like a boot room in the CPU. So there is, like, a piece of code in baked into the CPU which cannot be replaced. Which the CPU starts executing from. No, that's there is actually hard uh, CPU. Yeah, it's Isaac. Yeah. So that starts executing from its internal boot room, so to say. Um, now the boot room checks what the strapping of the CPU is and the detects the boot media. So in this case, let's say SPI flash, it loads some piece of the SPI flash into its own internal memory, like an SRAM or something. From that, it executes. That's usually the U-boot SPL. Uh, that thing initializes like the DRAM, basic pin mixing, clocking, that sort of stuff, and then loads the actual U-boot from, again, the boot media. It can be the same, it can be different. Depends on how you configure the SPL. So the SPL is something which you can already replace. It's usually like 64K. Again, depends on the chip. Uh, so once you have like the full U-boot running, uh, it can again load whatever from whatever boot media. Let's say the same boot media. You can load Linux kernel from there. You can load device tree. You can load uh, FPGA bitstream. Whatever you want. Start the Linux kernel, and from there it as usual. Yes, it's not that surprising. Except for sometimes you need to load the FPGA. You can do it in U-boot, you can do it in Linux. It's preferred if you do it in Linux because then you have more control over this entire system. It's so much more flexible. Uh, that, that's actually a good question. So uh, yeah, there was a question, if the Linux and the FPGA are communicating through a regular CPU bus, uh, I should have mentioned that, thank you. Uh, there are actually XE bridges on the Altera side, on the Xilinx side, I believe there are also XE bridges, right? Yeah, so like standard bus, yes. Right. Yeah, so the, the comment was that you can have uh, also other like bridges uh, in the FPGA, so like between XE and SPI and this sort of thing. Yeah, so you can synthesize anything into the FPGA then. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, there in the back. Yeah, so the question is about high availability. Uh, is it possible to like reboot this SOC without reloading the FPGA, right? Now, uh, with the device tree overlays, it actually is not, to my knowledge, possible. Uh, but what you can basically do is you can disable the DTOs and just say, OK, I load my FPGA in U-boot and keep it loaded. And that's it, right? So just make Linux not touch the FPGA at all and just assume there is hardware there. And if you reboot the system, yeah, just check whether the FPGA is loaded in U-boot. If not, load it. If it is, just use it. Uh, you will have to check what state the bridges are in. So if you want to access the content of the FPGA, you will have to make sure the bridges are enabled. And you can do that once after you load the FPGA and know that the content in the FPGA is valid. Then you can enable the bridges and just use the stuff in the FPGA. Thanks for the question. Does it always? So there was a comment that Zing actually nukes the content of the FPGA on reboot uh, from uh, someone in the, in the audience. Actually, we can discuss that after the talk if you want some more. That's an interesting question. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. I don't know. It seems kind of died. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there was a comment from uh, uh, from a friend of mine. Uh, he said that it's now called uh, FPGA region, not FPGA area, because it just kind of changed. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? What? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so uh, there was a question about x86 and device trees and the using DTOs and FPGAs. Uh, so on x86, usually the FPGA is sitting on a PCI Express, and you can definitely use device tree for that, right? I mean, you can describe a PCI Express device in a device tree, no problem. It's that flexible. Uh, I didn't try it myself, no. Super. Uh, did you hear it back there? Otherwise, just like come here, we can discuss that because there is a guy who is digging in that stuff, and it'd be great if we can discuss it together. So, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>